Hello, Snackers. This is Kareem Iskander. Hey, everyone. Matt DiNapoli here. Welcome to episode 151 of Snack Minute. On today's episode, we're going to be talking to our buddy Kyle about a kind of relatively new topic. It's been around for a while, but it's relatively new to us here at Cisco. Um, and it's called EBPF, and you're all probably chomping at the bit to understand what that is, and, and Kyle's here to walk us through it. So, Kyle, before we get into it, do you mind introducing yourself, and then we'll we'll dig into EBPF. Yeah, it's great to be on the show. My name is Kyle Winters. I am based in Irvine, California, and I'm a technical advocate with Cisco. Awesome. So to start off, let's just get into what is EBPF. So EBPF stands for Extended Berkeley Packet Filter. Um, this is, you know, you might be wondering, was there a Berkeley packet filter before? Yes, there was. And it was doing traditional network packet filtering. Uh, EBPF extends that far beyond just the packet filter use case, though. It allows the user space to communicate directly into the kernel and inject customized capabilities into the Linux kernel, as well as the Windows kernel nowadays, too, uh, to extend that capability and provide a rich set of customization. Uh, there's a lot of benefits to doing this as well, too, as opposed to modifying the kernel directly. Um, some of this is just the ease of use and the ability to quickly deploy these things. It does just-in-time compiling, so that way you don't need to restart your operating system to deploy one of these new capabilities when you're leveraging these Linux kernel modules. It has built-in security as well and some significant performance advantages to it as well. So you might be hearing the term EBPF coming up a lot, especially with HyperShield. Um, and that's something that we're going to be leveraging Cisco to not just build EBPF modules and leverage AI to secure applications across infrastructure, but also monitor EBPF modules as well, too, to make sure that malicious modules aren't being injected into the Linux kernel. Kyle, this is, um, this is great. Talk to us a little bit about the use cases that are around this from a Cisco perspective, because I know, I know we play in, in, in the user space with some of our products, we, us being Cisco, right? Mm -hmm. Where does that fit in? And, and what's, what, where, isn't there an AI play there too? Yeah. So there's a lot of very valuable use cases with EBPF and just to kind of put it into three high level buckets, I'm going to dive just quickly into each of them. Networking, observability, and security are three that come to mind from a Cisco perspective. So being able to do from a networking perspective, advanced packet filtering, just like the name implies, is one starting point. But you could also do things like load balancing through eBPF, DDoS uh, mitigation as well, too. If you, let's say you see malicious patterns of traffic coming in, leveraging eBPF to block that traffic and mitigate uh, distributed denial of service attacks is something that you can do as well from a networking perspective as well as a security perspective. Uh, observability is another one as well, too, being able to monitor system and application performance using eBPF uh, is a very valuable capability. Um, doing profiling of applications, understanding the latency, uh, because you have this, this level that's monitoring on, from the kernel, the entire system and all the different hardware components that are connected with it. You can really dive in and understand where latency is occurring as well as track and debug more effectively as well, too. And from a security perspective, there's a ton of use cases available for this, whether it's intrusion detection and prevention, being able to enforce and create firewall rules through eBPF. And since you're doing packet filtering, you can enforce uh, and essentially firewall rules through these modules as well, too. Runtime security enforcement, making sure that at runtime, anytime you're running any application, that you're validating the, the proper security posture of those systems and tools that are running. Um, as well as data exfiltration prevention. That's just another great example of some of the security use cases that you can leverage with eBPF. Now, where HyperShield comes in is together leveraging artificial intelligence AI to essentially drive these across a multi-cloud or multi-data center environment and be able to push these types of security controls to all of your systems wherever they may live and do that in an automated fashion, as well as be able to respond to real-time threats and adjust these, leveraging the just-in-time compiling and the, the quick, efficient nature of eBPF to do these things very quickly without having to reboot your entire system. 
So that's where the AI piece can come in with eBPF is leveraging that artificial intelligence to drive these dynamic changes across your infrastructure. So Kyle, all those use cases sound really cool. Um, I can totally see uh, how we would want to uh, kind of stop people from coming in the door before they even get to the door, which is super exciting and sounds like what eBPF is providing for us. But um, I think our snackers would really love to see the eBPF, um, a, a demo of eBPF in action, if, if we wouldn't mind. Yeah, absolutely. I would love to do that. So as you can see here, I've got an Ubuntu Linux server running. Um, and there's a lot of different tools that leverage eBPF. Um, there's SDKs that are built for it as well, too. Uh, one thing to note is that it's all this eBPF code is written in C. But there's SDKs available for tools like Python and Go as an example. And I'm just going to go ahead and just show you some examples, just some really simple examples of eBPF in action. Uh, so on my Linux machine, I have ECC installed, and I'm just going to run a command here. Um, sudo user sbin. And in this particular example, I'm just going to read the lines that are coming in from the Linux terminal. And this allows me a way to log all of the commands that a user might be running on their uh, Linux machine. As you can see here, we're tracking things like the time that the command was run, the process ID, and the command itself. So if I write a command like, who am I? You can see that that is tracked there like that as well. Um, if I want to, let's say, make a directory, um, let's call this one test, you'll see that that command is tracked as well. So this is an example of just a simple example of tracking command line functionality, the calls that are being made on the command line um, using eBPF. Now let's do a little bit more of a complex example, but still fairly simple enough to follow along with. I'm going to run this command here, sudo uh, user sbin, and in this one I'm going to do tcp connect. So tcp, TCP connect dash bpfcc. I'm going to go ahead and run this one, and you can see it's tracking the process ID as well as some information on the communication itself, such as the IP addresses of the sender and the destination and the port that is used. So let's just go ahead and start with one example. I'm gonna run a wget command in my other terminal here, and I'm just gonna to communicate to cisco.com. And you can see here, um, first there's a port E HTTP connection that is made to that IP address that you see on the screen there, followed by a 443, because at Cisco we, want to be secure and use HTTPS instead. So we direct to HTTPS. Uh, let's do another example though, wget google.com. And you can see here, this one actually pulled the page. It's communicating with google.com. And now you essentially have a log that's being generated of all the TCP connections that are occurring on with Linux host. So, you know, this is a very simple example. But as you can imagine, as your brain starts to think about these things, you can get far more complex in these capabilities. And there's a lot of capabilities that can be available to you today to use as well, too. So this is just a simple example with HyperShield. There's going to be a lot of cool, interesting use cases that come leveraging this eBPF technology. This is pretty cool. So, so what, what you've demonstrated is basically the eBPF protocol sniffing the essentially the communication in the packets that are happening between the client and then this is looking at the packets that are being sent down to the hardware to the nick itself is that what it is yeah, essentially you know because the kernel sits between the user space and the physical space it has a direct you know tie in to things on the physical space like the network card so anytime that network card is being invoked to do something like a TCP connection, like you see here, eBPF is able to track that, monitor that, log that, whatever it may be. So in a sense, yes. Yeah, it's really cool. <laughs> do we, so Kyle, I know, I know we're still working on, Cisco is still working on HyperShield. Um, I'm not so sure if it's G8 yet, um, but for our snackers, can you talk to us about some resources? If they want to learn more, uh, what's coming up? Uh, and what are your plans as a technical advocate uh, for for our snackers here? The best place to start is actually Cisco U. That's u.cisco.com. We have a free tutorial available to you there called Introduction to eBPF. And that's a great starting point on your eBPF journey. 
We'll be releasing some additional content on there as well, too, related to eBPF, especially how it ties into security. But I definitely recommend going to u.cisco.com as a great starting place and check out the tutorials that are available there. On top of that as well, I recommend checking out ebpf.io. It's a wonderful resource available for you that covers a lot of great details on the eBPF technology. And I highly recommend checking that one out as well once you become more familiar with eBPF. And, and Kyle, you also have a blog post coming up here? Yeah, I do have a blog post that I just released on blogs.cisco.com. Uh, it's introducing myself as one of the new technical advocates on the learning and certifications team. Uh, I will be taking a focus on security, so expect to see more security-related content coming from me in the future. Uh, and I'll also cover things in these blogs like EBPF as well, too. So looking forward to writing about these and sharing these with you all and getting more familiar with the Cisco community. It's good to have you on the team, Kyle. Yeah, we're really excited um, for all this content in the in the security space, but I'm really excited to see more of the use case specific content on eBPF, Kyle. So I'm going to hold you to that and you should become a regular guest here on Snack Minute, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> if we invite you back. If we invite him. I would love that. I'll bring the snacks next time. <laughs> um, I will say, unfortunately, we are at time, uh, but you are a first time guest. Um, and we always ask our first time guests, what superpower would you choose to have and why? Yeah, that's a, that's a very fun question. And, um, you know, for me, I love travel. I love experiencing new cultures and connecting with people. And for me, I think that superpower would just be the ability to speak any language on the planet. Oh. Um, you know, that would allow me to travel to new places and be able to connect with people more effectively, understand cultures more effectively, and be able to participate in those cultures more effectively, too. That's awesome. That's, that's a new one for us, Matt. Really? Yeah, I think that is a new one. I don't recall. Well, I thought you were going to say teleport, which has been our which has been our number one. But uh, yeah, being a, a hu human babble fish sounds great to me. <laughs> <laughs> I think both of those superpowers combined would would be perfectly ideal for me as well too. <laughs> <laughs> That's great, Kyle. Well, um, thank you for your time. I think uh, I, I'd like to see more of this uh, from you. Um, and uh, I'm sure our snackers are interested as well. So um, thanks for the quick intro. Snackers, hopefully you enjoyed today's episode. Um, thank you and stick around for uh, another episode of Snack Minute. Thank you all.